right, Mercy Hill, whether you are joining us online or at one of our campuses, I am so excited that you have joined us this weekend. Uh, my name is Ronald Redmond, and I am the director of high school ministry here at Mercy Hill. It is an absolute honor and privilege uh, for me to get to hang out with students. They, uh, they keep me feeling young, or at least trying to look the part. Um, and so it is a, a joy. I'm super excited uh, to be able to open God's Word this weekend. Hey, over the course of this series, we've been walking through the book of Ecclesiastes, uh, and we have seen that uh, it is uh, in the human heart that we have a propensity to look for under the sun uh, for things to give us ultimate sense of purpose and value. And what we're going to end up finding every single time we look for something under the sun to give us this source of meaning and purpose, we're going to see that it is a vain uh, and that it is only going to be fleeting. Uh, it's going to always cause us seeking more, desiring more, and it is like a chasing uh, after uh, the wind. And so Pastor Andrew, he has uh, set up this and we've talked through a lot of different uh, areas that we look to try to, to find uh, a sense of value and uh, purpose. And, uh, and so the last topic that we find in the book of Ecclesiastes is the topic of youth. Uh, and so I want to go ahead and get this out of the way. Um, you, there is uh, one way that I usually end up pronouncing the word youth, and, uh, and it does not come out with a TH, but it comes out with an F. Uh, and so there's going to be a couple times that you might hear me say youth. Uh, so I I've already kind of warned you that that might be coming. Hey, uh, the second thing I want to go ahead and get out of the way as we kind of dive into this topic of youth is I am not going to define what youth is. Uh, because uh, for those of you who might be hearing me for the first time, I do not want you to hear me call you old. All right. And so I'm just going to avoid that altogether. Instead, I'm just going to kind of refer to it as how the scriptures refer to it, which is uh, youth is described by uh, the prime of life. Uh, it is marked by tons of potential strength and, and, and vitality, the future being up front. And so uh, when I begin to think about uh, my earlier days, um, I, I think about uh, when I was young, I really wanted to be a, uh, a professional athlete. I, I don't know if you, anybody at the campuses have ever had that dream of being sort of a professional uh, athlete. One of the things about being a professional athlete, uh, when you're really, really good at a young age, uh, there's some things that kind of set you apart from all the other kids. Um, and, and so one of the things that is distinct about uh, youth phenoms, uh, those those that are really, really good at sports is that they are able to kind of go in and uh, really uh, perform at a high level, uh, even when they are performing around people that are that are maybe older than them. So for instance, like maybe a ninth grader is on the varsity uh, team and they are performing, uh, you know, just as they're just as competitive against the juniors and seniors uh, on the team. It's almost like they've kind of been here before, like they have kind of they have some wisdom that they are kind of walking in. They have an understanding of the game that is sort of beyond their years. It's almost like they are kind of like a veteran in like a rookie's body. Uh, I think about uh, LeBron James, uh, guys like Zion Williams that, that were, you know, in their uh, prime, in their youth, they were just out. They were just so far ahead of uh, everyone else. And, and I believe that when we think about this, uh, I believe spiritually God wants us to kind of be like that in our youth. He wants us to kind of be uh, this phenom where we are kind of operating in the game very differently. We, we sort of have a, a different sort of way in which we are playing uh, it is almost like a different game. You know, I think about LeBron, you know, the, the way in which he plays the game is probably a lot slower to him than it is everybody else who's on uh, the court. Uh, when it comes to uh, us, I believe God wants us to see the game differently. He wants to uh, see uh, us embrace his wisdom. And this starts in our youth. And this is how we begin to kind of walk in uh, this new uh, different way. Hey, I want you to hear the, the big idea that we are going to see this weekend is that the life that God wants for you starts now. See, 
What, what makes you a phenom isn't, I'm gonna go ahead and tell you, it's not that uh, you are playing the world's game, but that you're playing a different game altogether. Uh, and although there is an opportunity that is, uh, that is unique for those who are young and have sort of their whole lives ahead of them, if you're older, you still have the opportunity to play a different game. Uh, you have an opportunity to stand out. I think about, you know, even, you know, good championship teams, they have those veteran players who contribute uh, to the team. And so it's not too late for you. And so here's where we're going uh, with our time this weekend. We're going to be in Ecclesiastes chapter 11, the end of it. We're going to read three verses. And in our three verses, there are three imperatives uh, that we're going to kind of pause and talk about. Uh, and then we're going to end with uh, an application. Uh, and then that'll be our time together. So we're going to start Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verse 9 says this. Rejoice, O young man, in your youth and let your heart cheer you in the days of your youth. Walk in the ways of your heart and in the sight of your eyes. Now, when I think about uh, our culture, if I stop right there, there is a lot of the culture that would say yes and amen to everything that I just said, right? Where it is this idea of following your heart and whatever you set your sights on, you should pursue that. Uh, and so there is, that's the, co that's the culture's culture's mantra, right? It is the message that they will sort of get behind. But is this actually what the, the preacher is saying? Is, is that what he's saying to us? Let's continue to read uh, those, uh, the next part of the verses. It says, rejoice, O young man, in your youth, and let your heart cheer you in the days of your youth. Walk in the ways of your heart and in the sight of your eyes, but know that for all these things, God will bring you into judgment. And so he does say rejoice, in following your heart, but just know that the life that you live, you will be held accountable. There will be a judgment uh, that comes. And so I told you guys, we're going to look at those three. Um, we're going to look at three uh, imperatives. The first one is the rejoicing. Uh, and so what I want you guys to know, the re again, rejoicing is this idea of being, you know, taking delight in, enjoying, being happy about. Uh, there are some ways that we get from this, uh, from these verses about how we can do that well. Uh, and so there are three kind of terms I want to talk about as it relates to rejoicing, rejoicing now, rejoicing well, rejoicing with the end in mind. Uh, and so he, he says, listen, don't despise your youth. The, the preacher is saying that you should take advantage of the opportunities that you have while you are young. See, some of us simply need to hear that uh, tonight, that the word is calling us to enjoy the season that we're in, to not wish it away, uh, to not look ahead, to not sink uh, into, to not try to wish life and, and wish that we were already sort of uh, in a different place not to look at as though our youthfulness is something uh, that's a bad thing, not to try to grow up too fast. Listen, you are in this season where you have more energy, you have an opportunity, uh, you have more free time, enjoy it. Don't try to grow up too fast. There's a rejoicing well, that is the second point I want us to see. Some of us, maybe we don't despise our youth, uh, but we use our youth as sort of a reason or justification to not take responsibility. How, how many times have I heard students say, you know what, because I'm young, I'm supposed to act this way. I'm supposed to just kind of do what I want to do. Um, and, and really, this is just a cover up for being childish and not really growing up. But when it comes to rejoicing, the problem isn't just that we rejoice or that we would take delight in our youth uh, because the reality is, is we were all created to rejoice. We are designed to be rejoicers. The, the issue is that oftentimes we rejoice in the wrong thing. So the problem isn't that we rejoice, but it's the object of our rejoicing. We rejoice and we worship the wrong thing many times. Paul describes this in, in Romans 1, 25. He says, because they've exchanged the truth about God for a lie and they've worshiped and served the creature rather than create the creator who is blessed forever. So we end up rejoicing in things that are shallow, that are temporary, that are fleeting, that are, they satisfy for a moment and it is just like a chasing of the wind. You know, again, as I think about 
us being designed to rejoice. You know, one of my favorite seasons is Among Us. It is March Madness, right? That just started this weekend. And you want to see uh, some worshipers. I, I've seen the most, you know, reserved men become undignified when their favorite team wins. Um, and so it's worship. It's what we do. You think concerts, stadiums, you think theaters. This is all pre-COVID days, right? Uh, they're full of worshipers. It's what God created us for. My question to you is, what are you rejoicing in today? What are you taking light in? What are you enjoying today? What is the object of your rejoicing? The last thing I wanna say about rejoicing is rejoicing with the end in mind. Uh, again, I know I stopped when I first read uh, uh, verse nine where it says, you know, follow your heart. Uh, you know, whatever you set your sights on, pursue that. Now, if, if the, the culture's kind of listening to that, they're, they're like, yeah, I'm with you. Yeah, yes and amen. But then the, the second half of that verse, they're like, hold on. You know, they're, they're ready to cancel uh, him for the second part of this verse. It's like, what, what do you mean, judgment? Uh, wh what do you mean, judge me for, for what I'm doing? I know even when I was a, uh, not a Christian, I wore this, this bomber jacket that said only God can judge me. And on the back. And, and really what it was, was a justification of my uh, issue or, or my wrongdoings and my sin by, by res really resisting any type of judgment. You know, I was justifying what I was doing in my lifestyle by saying, you know what? No, no one can judge me. And I think when we talk about youth, a lot of the common failures of youth is really neglecting to take responsibility for their actions, not really wanting to uh, embrace the consequences of those. So, you know, whatever seems fun, exciting, thrilling, they will do that. And in this verse, the, the, the preacher really does remind us, hey, listen, you will be held accountable to your actions. You will be uh, held responsible for the things that you've done. I, I remember when I was in middle school and one of my favorite teachers, I don't know why she was one of my favorite teachers because she, she was my English teacher and I, I love more math and science. And, uh, but anyway, she, uh, she, she I had a really good relationship with her and you know, I broke a rule that she told me uh, not to break. And the, the rule was I, I jumped out of the window. Now, you can ask me about the, the story later, but I'm, I'm here today. But, you know, I just knew this teacher loved me. She was going to let me free uh, and, you know, not, get, not really give me the punishment. But I ended up in detention because of it. Uh, you know, my, my point in what I'm saying is, you know, how unloving would it be to just allow me to do something that could be potentially harmful and not hold me accountable to the action in which I did? And so I think what we do is we hear, oh, God wants me to follow my heart, to, to rejoice in my youth. Oh, but he is, there's judgment to think that those things are at odds. They're not at odds at all. It is God's kindness that would lead him to confront the way that we are broken in our rejoicing in the things that we're pursuing that are not for uh, our good. Let's continue in verse 10. Remove vexation from your heart and put away pain from your body. For youth and the dawn of life are vanity. So vexation and vanity is what I'm gonna talk about from these verses. First, vexation, anxiety, fear, angst. We've seen earlier in this series that anxiety and sorrow, they, they come to the just and the unjust all the same. It is part of living in a broken world. And so when it comes to removing vexation, I think our culture excels at this, excels at removing anxiety from our hearts and minds. But oftentimes it does so in the most healthy, unhealthy of ways. It, it does so via numbing. In other words, the, the culture, in order to remove vexation, a lot of times it is uh, as a result of endless amounts of Netflix and TV or endless amounts of video games or social media or procrastination, just putting it off and not wanting to deal with it. And if I'm being honest, you know, my, I personally have a thing for Mountain Dew and honey buns uh, as the, the way I go to, uh, to, to try to, man, just feel better. And 
it is a temporary feeling. It's a temporary, I, you know, I feel better. Like this has brought me joy, but it is fleeting. It does not last. Is there a better way to remove vexation? I think so. I think the better way is to, do, to put those things away is by addressing them by taking them to God, by seeking counsel, by allowing people to speak into situations and bring uh, light. Listen, the pain of life doesn't go away when you numb it, but it goes away when you hand it over. And this, and this is what makes living in community such a vital and a necessary part of the Christian life. Because God gives us other believers who we can bear burdens with and they can speak hope and truth into our lives. But we miss this when we neglect to live in community. And so for students, we have students groups. For our college students, we have family and D groups. For our adults, we have community groups and we need them. And so at the end of the service, you guys are gonna have the opportunity to, to hear from what God is doing in one of our groups in particular, which I'm really excited uh, for you guys to, to hear that uh, was happening in uh, our 10th grade girls uh, group. Uh, all right, and so listen, the, the second thing I wanna talk about is vanity. Listen, the end of verse 10, the dawn of your life, the prime of your life is vanity. It's fleeting, you're young one day, the next day you aren't. Uh, my wife and I were watching TV this uh, past Monday and she, uh, there was a reference to our college days and she looked at me and she said, that was 10 years ago. And I said, I know I'm getting old. I don't need you to remind me of that. Now, listen, uh, and so um, they're, they're fleeting just like that, you know? And so the, the point is that we, we've seen up until this point, there's right rejoicing. We've seen that there's vexation. We've seen that God wants us to handle these things differently, but how do we go about doing that? Well, I think uh, the last verse that we're gonna look at, uh, chapter 12, verse one, gives us the answer. Remember also your creator in the days of your youth, before the evil days come and the years draw near, which you say, I have no pleasure in them. Listen, the command here is more than just forgetting something. Not, not just not forgetting, but it is letting the truth of God completely shape how we view life and how we live. It gives us a different set of rules, helps us to see the game completely differently. See, all throughout the, the scriptures, there is this theme of remembering. And uh, specifically in the Old Testament, there's three categories of remembering. Uh, and I want to kind of uh, highlight those for you. And so the first one is remembering your creator, who your creator is, remembering who your creator is. And so Psalm 8, uh, chapter three, I'm sorry, chapter eight, verse three uh, says this, when I look at your heavens and see the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him? And the son of man that you care for him, God is creator. You know, one of the things that uh, I, I, that I benefit from uh, daylight savings time, not to say that I, I, I'm excited about losing an hour, but it is being able to, to on the way to s taking my kids to school to see the sun rise and just marvel at the beauty of creation. You know, uh, when I begin to think about how, how big our creator is, I, I immediately think back to a video I saw over five years ago and uh, there was a video where the guy was describing the relationship of the earth to the sun, okay? And so what he did was in his uh, illustration, he said that the earth was uh, the size of a golf ball. And if the earth was the size of a golf ball, you could put 906, no, I'm sorry, nine, nine, 60,000, 960,000, that's the number. I used to be a math teacher, people. Uh, you know, they, they say you don't use it, you lose it. I'm like, I see the number in my head. Uh, 960,000 earths into the sun, okay? So listen, I know some of us are, you know, not doing well in math. We can blame it on COVID, right, and, and virtual school. But let me give you kind of a better way to flesh that out. It's like, you know, filling an entire school bus up with golf balls, so that is how many earths can go into the sun. 
Let's let that sink in for a moment. Like you want to feel small, just think about the grandeur of God. But this verse tells us that he, although he's that great, he's mindful of us and that he cares for us. Can we please just let that sink in today? The next category of remembering is remembering what your creator has done. In Exodus chapter 12, uh, God tells the the people of Israel to remember uh, him by setting up the the Passover feast. And so if you uh, will remember the story uh, where the Israelites were enslaved in Egypt and God raises up Moses to send to Pharaoh to say, hey, let my people go. And Pharaoh refuses, he hardens his heart. And so God sends plagues uh, to get him to relent and he refuses. And then finally he sends the worst of all, which is the first uh, born son of all in Egypt would, uh, would, would, would die. And, uh, and he says to the people of God, hey, uh, take a lamb and uh, take its blood and put it on the doorpost. And when you do so, the angel of light, uh, of, of the angel of the Lord will pass by and, uh, and you will be delivered. And so then he says, hey, I want you to mark this day as a memorial and you shall keep it as a feast of the Lord uh, throughout your generations as a statue forever and to keep it as a feast. And what is he saying? He wants the people to remember what I've done, that you didn't deliver yourself out of Egypt. I did. You didn't send the plagues, I did. You didn't uh, part the Red Sea, I did. He is saying, hey, I want you to remember who I am, but also what I have done. The last category of remembering that is prominent is to remember what your creator has commanded of you. And listen, students, what I want you to hear is that God's, commands for you is not to rob you of something that you might enjoy. In other words, what I'm saying is the the commands of scripture is really all about lining you up with the way God has designed things to work. Look at Uh, Look at Proverbs chapter six, verse 23 with me. It says, for this command is a lamp. This teaching is a light and correction and instruction are the way to life. And so God's, when he says something about marriage, it's not that he is trying to uh, make you have a horrible marriage. How would that glorify God? He's trying to lead you into what marriage is intended to be. When he says, uh, puts parameters around sex, he's not trying to be a killjoy. He's the one who's invented it. It is it's his idea. He's not trying to rob you. He's trying to lead you into the gift that he has for you. So all of the commands of God are not about taking from you, but it is about leading you into the fullness of what he has for you. And so we have to view his commands differently. His commands, it leads us away from our broken rejoicing to embracing right rejoicing. And in a sense, this is our invitation to be in the life that God has set forth to to the fullness of of joy. Listen, his commands, uh, they are beautiful in that, A, when we obey them and we follow them, we go, we we are led into the life that he has for us. B, when we neglect to follow them or fail to follow them, it shows our, our need for a savior. So the commands of scripture, they are good. And so, As we conclude, how do we do this? The application for all of us is to not waste another day of your life. Listen, being a phenom, it is less about you and more about God. It is less about you being something and more about you being attached to someone. The part, this partly comes through remembering and living the life, your life in light of who God is, what he's done and what he commands of you. This is embracing his wisdom. But this work is also supernatural. 
See, several times the preacher, he talks about how our actions is connected to our heart. And this is consistent with all of scripture. It is our heart that flow out our actions. And so if we are to live differently, we need a new heart. Let's take a look at verses nine and 10 one more time. Rejoice, O young man, in your youth and let your heart cheer you in the days of your youth. Walk in the ways of your youth or of your heart and the sight of your eyes, but know that for all these things, God will bring judgment, remove vexation from your heart and put away pain from your body. Guys, in our sin, our eyes have taken us many places. Following our hearts had let, have led us astray so many times. But Jesus, he has taken that judgment on himself. He has walked perfectly. He, his eyes are pure. Everything that he has done is perfect. And instead of removing sorrow and putting away pain, he did just the opposite. For you and I, he took that. He took it on the cross so that you and I wouldn't have to receive judgment. And so if we want to play a different game, if we want to be the young phenom, let the one who created the game sub in for you. That's the invitation. You do that by placing your faith and your trust in what he has done. Galatians 2.20, one of my favorite verses, it says, I have been crucified with Christ. And it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I live, I live it by faith in the Son of God who lived and he loved me and gave himself up for me. We can play different when he plays through us. And so if you've not taken that step to say, you know what, I want to declare my faith. I want to follow you. I want to sub you in. I want to receive Jesus, his his death and resurrection on my behalf. If you've not done that and you want to, we are going to be baptizing in a couple weeks at Easter. And we would love for you to, to declare that declare you're ready to to make that decision that you believe that Jesus has done everything necessary to save you, that you wanna follow him with your life. If you are ready to do that, please text baptism to 81411 and we will contact you and set that up. It is time for you to declare your faith and give him the glory to sub him in. Listen, for those of you, maybe you're hearing this and you're, you're thinking about your youth and you're, you're, you know, maybe it's full of regret. Maybe, you, maybe you've missed the opportunity. You wouldn't say that you're in the prime of your life. What I want you to hear is there's so much grace for you. You know, Paul's attitude in Philippians was that, man, I press on toward the goal. I forget what lies behind. There is such an opportunity I think about some of our leaders in MA students, some of the best leaders that we have, they met God at a later age. And because of what they have gone through, that has been the very fuel, the motivation for why they are pouring out into students. So you have such an incredible opportunity to get in the game and to make an impact. Hey parents, how are you in helping your youth, your students take hold of these things, knowing and remembering that it is, it's a heart. It is in the heart. Are you shepherding their hearts or are you after behavior modification? And are you thinking more about what they do rather than what they love? Guys, we're, we're gonna be having a prayer night. Pastor Andrew mentioned that. Uh, Monday, March 22nd, and there are many of you who who need to be there. Parents who who need to be there praying on behalf of your youth, your children. 
There's several of you who need to be praying for family and friends, for them to experience the power of the resurrection, that they might come to Easter services and the Lord might meet them there. We wanna invite you to, to be there. Listen, the life that God has for us, it starts today. Some of us have been one foot in, one foot out, lukewarm. There's a call to go all in, to go all in today. Let us pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you that because of Jesus and what he has done, we can be grafted into a new, on a new team and a new game, living by a different set of rules, empowered by the spirit of God to live through us. I pray, would you do that for the sake of your glory and your renown? In Christ's name, amen.